In this episode of Here's to the Ladies Who, we take a closer look at what happened inside of shutdown. What we did, when we did it, who we did it with, and how we found new ways of storytelling in the absence of our beloved art form. Tiger King. Shit's Creek. Tiger King. I did Bridgerton. Tiger King. I Tiger King. Tiger King. Shit's Creek. Shit's Creek. Shit's Creek. Bridgerton also. Chef's kiss. Bridgerton. Shit's Creek. It was Shit's Creek that broke the bad streak of no TV for me. Tiger King. Shit's Creek. Tiger King. Tiger King. Bridgerton. Tiger King. Maybe Tiger King. Love Shit's Creek. I watched Tiger King, but it was under duress. I've been to watch Shit's Creek twice. Bridgerton, first of all. I mean, I was just like, oh, woo. I had to watch that by myself. Um, this is Here's to the Ladies Who. At the beginning, they watched Tiger King. I did not indulge. I have not seen one second of Tiger King. Wait, have you seen Clickbait? No. Oh my God, unbelievable. Murder mystery, love, love, love Clickbait. All the like murder series or like the Ted Bundy <laughs> uh, documentaries and stuff of, of, you know, the murder or serial killer things. Oh, yeah, we watched Ozark. Oh, and Yellowstone. During the pandemic, I actually watched a lot of Met Opera HD performances. There's a beautiful series called Shtisal, which is from Israel. There's a kind of luxury in the ability to immerse yourself in, in something that's actually not even in English that I normally don't have the bandwidth for. RuPaul's Drag Race, I'd never watched before, even though I, I love drag culture. I never saw the show. Competition shows stress me out. They make me feel like I'm auditioning. But I watched it and it's like my absolute obsession. I was also, you know, going down the YouTube rabbit hole and watching, you know, Tony Awards from, from days gone by. There were a couple of where my boss and I just sort of, <laughs> it's so sad, but we call each other. We'd be like, okay, let's watch these Tony Awards or we'd be like texting each other while watching the Tony Awards at the same time, it'd be like 1960 something. Um, and as a young uh, woman in the industry, sometimes it's hard to get that past experience. It's really helpful <laughs> to go watch Tony Awards ceremonies because you get the nominees, you get some performances. It's like a little bit of a study guide. I binged watched Succession which I love. So what else did I binge watch? Oh my God, I, I feel like I blacked out that year. I mean, if they didn't drop a new season of Great British Bake Off in the middle of the pandemic, I would not have survived. I, like everyone else who lives in Brooklyn, learned how to make a great focaccia. I got very into focaccia. Oh. Um, I didn't trust myself to keep beating a starter. I refused to do sourdoughs, um, <laughs> just blatantly, I was like, not gonna do it. I'm not gonna learn it. Everybody else is doing. I don't wanna. Um, but I I started doing embroidery. We watched all the groceries. We you know it was like a routine. My my boyfriend and I would go to the grocery store. We drive the car. We come back. We put them all the groceries in the garage. And then you'd wash each of them with the Clorox wipes. You take all the fruit and vegetables. You put it in the thing. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm so glad we learned not to do that anymore. My wife and I were at a farmhouse and we would go, we would have our groceries delivered and there was this little window by the kitchen and I'd stand outside like washing them down and pass them to the window, through the window. And like they're in the sink, we would just drop the vegetables right in the sink and she'd wash them down. It's, you know, cause we, you, you didn't know. Yeah. Like I remember going to visit an aunt and like she had a COVID station set up in her garage before you came in our house. So you have to take everything off, hand washing. She would like slice all your coat, your shoes, like all kinds of things. She's taking the groceries out of the plastic bags and like wiping them down before we brought them into the house. I wash my, my ID, my credit cards. You realize how many other people touch those. I wipe my phone down every day. I just decided that I was gonna approach cooking as a creative act. Like that was 
was like, this is my creative act right now. I started a garden also in the spring. I planted tomatoes and um, some squash and cucumbers and some peas. I really love gardening. And it was something that my father and my mom's dad both did there, so it was it had a connection for me too. My response was to reach out to community. And so I reached out to community about other folks and resources. And that is actually the genesis of the Freelance Artist Resource Collective, Producing Collective, which at the time at the start of it was four folks and it growing to five that got started. Um, and then those incredible human beings started reaching out to their communities. So we uh, curated six webinars, again, partnering with HowlRound about that. And we were pulling people in from all over. They were not just in the theater industry to share their knowledge. And then like, how do we take care of our bodies, right? So what is our somatic response to this health crisis that we find ourselves in? Right. The, the pictures I just remember pretty early on of like Italy being the poster child of blanket death. Right. And like, is that coming here? What do we do with that? So we were really working to make sure that artists and it's not always true. Right. But that artists who may feel more or may be in tune to um, their feelings were also getting the support that they needed to be able to negotiate and navigate this new territory, right, um, of personhood. Well, I also m made space for other people, like almost um, uh, immediately, Blackboard moved online. So I got the Zoom account and we started doing the uh, community night, something that Bla Blackboard has done for, since we started in 2008, has been a community night where a, 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 a Black playwright brings up to 10 pages of new work and it is cold read by whoever is there. We moved that to Zoom. And then I would offer my it was a Zoom account to to uh, to other people who ne needed it. We instituted recess in my house, um, which is really fun because Scott and I would say we're not going to like we'll all have lunch and recess together. And I don't know why adults ever stopped having recess. I'm like, it's the greatest thing in the world. You eat and then you like play ball for 25 minutes. Like we should all do that. Like, why are we sitting around eating coffee? We should be playing kickball after lunch. It was so fun, like really fun. It was the thing that I looked forward to. And, and I would, you know, someone say, oh, can we have a meeting at 1230? And I, oh, I'm sorry, I have an appointment. And I was like, oh my God, it's recess. Like I can't have a meeting during recess. And then like whatever followed the meeting, I was always like hair flat. <laughs> I think a grief reaction for myself, which was um, I started working on a documentary, not unlike this, although different POV, um, but I felt a tremendous need to think about and talk to other, other theater makers. I was so curious because I started also thinking about historically, you know, Everyone talks about how Shakespeare wrote during plagues and obviously in literature there's, you know, depression era literature and, and post Holocaust and all of these things were really incredible art got made. So I wanted to talk to different artists about what they were working on. Unlike many other art forms, our art form theater requires an audience. Like, you know, you can see dance, you can hear music, and it's not that it's not enhanced by an audience, but it's not required. Theater is different. Theater is a dyad. It's between a relationship between an audience member and an interpreter on stage. And so what did it look like all of a sudden when half of that was taken away? Is that still theater? I had a friend reach out to me, Benj Pasek, who's a musical theater writer, um, and he said, hey, Nobody's going to be able to gather together with their family for Seder this year. And um, because of that, we're going to do a virtual Seder. Do you want to help us produce it? 
And I thought about it for a second and said, yeah. And so we started putting that together like 10 days before the thing happened. And, um, and it was amazing, like to gather in this virtual community with these other producers and makers and editors and writers. And we had all these celebrities who were doing it because they didn't have anything else to do either. And we're all like suddenly in the same boat, which like very rarely happens. Like I always feel like there's a, even a hierarchy in any sort of producing of these events when you're working with talent and the sort of communication. And in this regard, it was like, everyone's free. Everyone has the same amount of knowledge about what's going on and everyone just wants to like find community. And then that just sort of like sparked this interest in all these other virtual productions sort of coming my way. And I pivoted into continuing to produce, but just in a new medium. I got a call from CV Productions about orchestrating on the Ratatouille TikTok musical. We were the primary ticketer for um, Ratatouille, the TikTok musical. Um, and that was honestly a, a big, fun, very unexpected project. If you'd asked me in January of 2020, would we be, you know, a producer and the primary ticketer and host of a digital musical based on a TikTok video, I would have been like, what? Like, I, <laughs> um, but it was an amazing opportunity and it was actually a great way to introduce some new customers into theater. And we hope it'll be a gateway for them into going to see live theater. Um, in the year ahead and, and beyond. When we are working in the digital space, we need to be just as engaging and captivating as when we are live and in person. And to figure out how we're gonna do that, well, we had to keep it really human because that's what theater does. It, it gives you a human experience or it allows you to experience peoples and, and worlds and cultures that you otherwise would have never experienced. Rosie O'Donnell hosted like a virtual um, night where she was like having all these people on. And my wife and I sat at our high top table in our kitchen and we like lit candles and we like set the table, which is something we never did. And we propped up our laptop and we like did the first live stream that Rosie O'Donnell did where she had all of these people on. It was such that thing of Rosie O'Donnell always being a champion of Broadway. And it was like she was like doing that again. And it felt so honest. And she's so good at just being very uh, raw. And that's what that night felt like. About six weeks in, I got invited to come on to my first virtual project, which was Broadway Does Mother's Day, a benefit event for... Uh, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Um, and so it, within six weeks, I was suddenly all, I, I was suddenly working on a virtual project and busy again for a very uh, truncated window of time. Um, but so each time a project would end, I would kind of have this, you know, week or two where I was enjoying uh, my freedom and my lack of responsibility. And then I would kind of fall into this darker place, to be honest about it, um, where I was feeling kind of listless and kind of useless, and I wasn't quite sure where to direct my energies. I, I was a producer on uh, a virtual production of A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, which was an all AAPI uh, production and creative team, as well as cast, um, so that The Gentleman's Guide was a benefit uh, raising money for Stop AAPI Hate. I, for one, learned a lot about producing uh, and having to adapt to, you know, scheduling and shipping costumes to people across the country um, and capturing on Zoom. Um, so there was a lot of learning in the process, but there were a lot of fun. The only projects that I worked on during the shutdown ended up being projects that were specific to the shutdown, which, um, you know, we did. I Part of the reason I do theater and not TV film is because I love the live medium. So um, something was definitely lost in that for me. And I spent a lot of time in productions online, actually, and I loved that. Uh, just a cool new exploration of different mediums. The one thing I can say is that I up until this point, didn't have any experience really producing theater, but I'm a lover of theater. And I thought I have the means in order to facilitate this new sort of organization or group of, of, of like-minded artists. 
And um, that was a gift for me. I felt like I was actually doing something during this pandemic that was creative and positive. I mean, isn't that what we all want to be able to do is, is create even when it's dark out there. I mean, I remember when we were filming that first day when we actually finally got to the theater to fully run our show that was not just a tech run or a lighting run. And seeing that with 12 cameras set up at the same time, which was crazy, that moment was, it was, you know, the true meaning of Christmas. It's like, that's why we're doing this is our show and we're bringing it back to life. And that is why we put in all of this hard work and time and blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the not having it made a really sharp divide. I think people got like a new clarity on like people who were looking at it and going, I haven't done theater in X amount of months and I actually am happier in whatever else I'm doing right now. Um, because like, frankly, like this business is stressful. It's unstable, um, it's, it moves fast and is a lot of work. And some people realized like, I'm happier not doing it. And that is fine, that's great. The other half of people realized we will not be happy without it. Um, and I am firmly in that camp. There's not really like an ambiguity anymore because we were all put in the position of not being able to do it. And so it made us think about like, well, what happens if I'm not doing this? It's like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. And every time I tried to quit, I was not in fact done. I tried to quit the year in high school. I applied to college as a linguistics major, but um, it's, you know, I, even when I applied to college as something else and had every intention of never doing it again, um, I kept getting pulled back because I, I can't do anything else.